Hi, I'm Stefan Schwab. I'm the CEO of Enlighted. And today on the show, we will talk about what a big corporation can learn from a really, really small startup and how we can prevent the small, nimble startup culture from the big corporation and what it means and, what it, and how it helps to work in different countries to set up such a new business venture. Stay tuned. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, he's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dov Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dov Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of Leadership Excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives. Let me ask you, what do you need to do to up-level your leadership? You know, big multinationals are always looking for young, vibrant companies doing innovative things. However, there, there's also a lot of startups who actually start out with the idea of being acquired by a larger company and so the founders can go off and do a, the next new thing. Even though the multinational may be delighted with the penetration into the market share that they got from the acquisition and, uh, and the founders might be happy with the new bank account, the nightmares often begin right there. Cultures clash people and ideas and innovation get dismissed and they could where well, where there could have been fertile ground quickly becomes stalled and at worst even uh, com becomes completely barren but what if there's a way to have nimble collaborative acquisitions well stay tuned because that's where we're going on today's show i'm your host Dov baron i'm here to assist you tapping into the one thing in your business that changes everything by transforming meaning into action to find out how you can Tap into more of that from me, go to dovbaron.com. That's D-O-V-B-A-R-O-N.com. This episode of Leadership and Loyalty is brought to you in part by our other podcast, Curiosity Bites. Curiosity Bites is the answer to the question, how can we bring people together who completely disagree? This is exactly what your heart, your mind, and your soul has been craving. It's your chance to sit in on some real and often rather intense conversations with some of the world's most interesting people. We're talking about philosophers, neuroscientists, astronauts, uh, holy people, quantum physicists, skeptics, entrepreneurs, Grammy award-winning entertainers, a whole range of people you would never even imagine. It is an absolutely fascinating conversation. I promise you, you will be delighted to find out how you can get more of that, how you can sink your teeth into a delicious episodes of Curiosity Bites, simply go over to dovebaron.com. As always, you can find this show and our other show on the Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, on Google Podcasts, wherever it is that you tune into podcasts. And we always need your help in staying relevant. So please get over there, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. We really appreciate it. If you are a regular listener, a big thank you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners. We're honored and grateful to be cited by Inc.com is the number one podcast to make you a better leader. And you can also listen to both of our podcasts by going to Google Home or Alexa by simply saying, play Dov Baron podcast. Again, thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. We've all heard the nightmare of an M&A. The multinational conglomerate comes along and acquires a young, nimble, emerging organization. And within two to four years, everything that made the acquisition acquisition look so great, so valuable, has been crushed under the boot of the corporate Borg. The multinational has any number of reasons for the failed M&A, and they move on writing off the acquisition as an affordable loss. Meanwhile, they have lost the innovation, the innovative minds, the potential market share, and maybe hundreds or even thousands of employees feel betrayed and thrown on a trash heap. So the question becomes, is there a way that this, that we can have a, an acquisition without the integration into that hive mind of the big company? Is there a way to successfully integrate without losing the culture that made the acquired company so valuable? 
Moreover, is there a way to create an open ecosystem of collaboration without suffocation of the very essence of what made the company valuable to acquire? Well, stay tuned because that's exactly going where we're going with our guest today. Our guest today is Stefan Schwab. Stefan is the CEO of Enlighted. This is a Siemens company. His priority goal since becoming CEO of Enlighted, which is a commercial IOT, Internet of Everything tech startup company, uh, has been to keep the innovation alive as the company scales. He has tested and proven his approach for the past two years, fostering innovation, strengthening team collaboration, and driving business growth. Over 12 years, Stefan has advanced through positions of increased responsibility in executive management, including uh, assignments in Germany and Singapore. And in 2014, he was named Executive General Manager of Siemens Building Technology Division for Australia and New Zealand. As CEO of Enlighted, he is not only transforming the office work experience by revolutionizing the way intelligent buildings and people interact, the company software also helps to improve the workflow and process in the healthcare industry. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and help me welcome IOT Breakthrough CEO of the Year, Stefan Schwab! Wow. Thank you so much. Hey. Uh, I really appreciate the warm welcome and uh, it's a real honor for me to be here um, along your always distinguished guests and have to be able to, to talk to you about um, what you just described perfectly. So uh, really looking forward to it. Excellent. Thank you, sir. I'm, I'm excited to have you here. You know, um, before we jump in, tell us, when did you get this, this new award? You were given the award when we had talked about it last time, uh, unless you were being humble, it's since then, but who knows? When was it? Uh, the award actually uh, in January 21. So um, uh, I received it. So but just, it okay. be, I have to say it's not me, it's the team because what we put together there during this uh, crazy last 12 months, this is, was amazing. And I'm just the leader. I have the, the honor to lead this uh, amazing team. So, and uh, yeah, I didn't know when we spoke and did uh, the preparation, which I very much enjoyed as well. Our prep call. I didn't know about that. And um, yeah, it's, that's great. That's good for you, man. Yeah. So <laughs> congratulations to you and to your team, of course. Thanks a lot. So, you know, one of the things we always like to start with is in, a, in this age of influencers, who is somebody who has influenced you or your leadership in a significant way that may not be somebody we know, maybe somebody we've never even heard of, somebody we wouldn't su suspect who's really had a massive impact on you and your leadership style? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And I actually have to say, I started to reflect on that um, when I started my, my, my professional career. And then I figured out it was actually my grandpa. And really? uh, yeah, but during that time, I didn't, I didn't realize it because I was just thinking, okay, he's talking crazy. I mean, I was uh, 18 years old. What does he want from me? And he was asking me actually the right question. Where do you want to go in life? What, what purpose um, do you have? And how do you want to change the environment? And also, he was also talking about responsibility uh, I, I'm having. And during that time, you know, you're 18 years old. You just finished school. You don't know. What does he want from you? But then you know, I, beer I, and girlfriends. <laughs> That's my responsibility. And my, my opus talking to me about responsibility. Beer and girlfriends. I'm with yeah. that. Exactly. And, and he was asking me, hey, when do you want to finish your studies? What do you want to do? How do you want to make an impact and things like that? And um, yeah, I started my professional career and I was starting to think about it. Who, who influenced me? Because I did a complete different way, for example, my parents did. Um, also, you mentioned before where I've been in the past, my parents always stayed in the place they were born, raised, they didn't move away. I'm, I'm the opposite. I'm a single child, so they also have no reference point there. But I have to say my grandpa was influential for me uh, looking backwards. Unfortunately, um, he died very early, but I'm very proud actually, I have to say, of the advice he has given me because I think he helped me really to be successful, also reflect on things, but then also still stay humble and not right. getting overconfident and kind of, yeah, then in the end also, I think complacent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oftentimes when, when the ego gets there. So when you think about the direct impact, 
<clears throat> and how, <clears throat> excuse me, and how you lead, how does that directly impact the people you lead? Because it's impacted you, but you know, impact is not, doesn't stop at one level. Hopefully it goes on. So how has it changed the way that you lead others? Yeah. Um, so what, what I learned over years and learned also from him is asking these questions. So it's not like that um, you have to have all the answers um, to everything. It's actually you and the team can work out the answers, but you have to provide questions. You have to provide only some guidance. You have to listen um, to, to your people. And this for me is also not only valid for the professional life. This also goes back into my the private life, I would say that listening is a very, very important skill set. Um, and also be curious. I mean, this is also what I learned from him. Be curious, be, be willing to learn new things. Um, and this really helped me over the time, over my career. Um, and yeah, so that, that's, that's the thing. And I also want to give this again to my leaders because I'm not leading this company alone. We are a lot of people. And in the end, you can say every one of our 220 employees are a leader in its space. Yes. And um, I want to I wanna support everyone in our company to, yeah, be successful. And I believe you, and, and I truly have seen it over the last couple of years, you cannot do that, but just giving this direction, this direction. And no, not yeah. at all. Yeah. And yeah, I'm really, so, really proud of that. So you said something in there about, you know, about your mom and your dad and, and how, you know, they were in a certain town, never left that town. And as I stated at the beginning, you know, you, you started out in Germany, you've worked in Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, now the US, you're in the US. Um, that can't, I mean, you also have a family that can't have been easy on your family. Talk to us about being that kind of leader. You've moved around, you have to take your family with you. How do you, how do you create a supportive environment for your family that enables you to do that? Because I know a lot of leaders have gone through that and many of them disastrously, right? Yeah, Ex excellent point. Um, because without my family and especially my closest family, now uh, my wife and our kids, it's not possible what um, not only I personally have achieved, but also what then I achieved with the companies, but also together with my family. So, I mean, um, early on, my, my parents had big trouble dealing with that, that I'm going overseas, that I'm going away from the hometown. Um, and I elaborate further on that, but what I wanted to say, actually the, the, the relationship between my parents and myself, because I did what I did, has improved significantly. As I said, I'm a single child. People who are single childs know the difficulties and the benefits of that. But mm -hmm. I definitely and truly see the improvement in the relationship between um, my, my parents and myself since, since I went on this journey. Um, and then, I mean, early on, I discussed with my wife during that time, girlfriend. So I said, look, um, I'm very curious. Um, I want to see the world. I want to work in different cultures and different environments. Are you in or not? And she was in because she is actually wanted to experience the same. And um, so together we actually we lived our dream. Um, and the good thing is, I think we have both open mindsets. Also, when you go into different cultures, other countries, I got a good advice when I came to Australia, or not a good advice, actually good feedback, where we once spoke about, okay, how can you be successful in these different countries' environments? And uh, a person over there said to me, look, Stefan, um, you came in and you behaved like a guest, like a guest when it comes to your house, you want a guest to behave. So, um, and I think that is something I always kept on top of my mind, moving around, I'm a guest and I wanna learn. And you see that for me is, is, the, is a great lesson in the whole thing around acquisitions because, you know, this is the subject of these nimble acquisitions. That's what we're talking about here. But, and oftentimes I think that it goes in, like I said, like the Borg, we will, you know, resistance is futile. We will integrate you rather than understanding we bought you because you've got something and we have actually got to, we've actually got to scale down our coming in like a bulldozer and come in smaller. So it's, it's interesting to me that you've had this success with the company that you're with now, 
and you, but it's actually based on this mentality that you had in going into other countries. Like for me, when I, I did the same, I traveled a lot and lived in different countries and, and was part of different cultures. And, and for me, it was always, I was always blown away by the arrogance of people who would, you know, who would say, well, it's not like at home. Well, then go home, go home. You lived in Australia. I lived in Australia for many, many years. And in Australia, there's a term, you may be familiar with it. I don't know how long you were there, but there was a term, it's called whining palms. And it means, <laughs> right? I and it's the own. English people who complain about Australia. Right? And, and people say, oh, you're a palm. And I go, yeah, but I'm not a whining palm. Like, <laughs> I'm not complaining. Like, oh, the fish and chips are not as good here. The beer is not as good here. Well, then go back. Go back. And, and so that, that attitude of being a guest in a country is also the same thing that you took into companies. Talk to us a little bit about that, because I think it's really important when going in, because you've been given by the, the big overlord Siemens saying, okay, you're, you're going to go in, you're going to take over this. Did have, uh, you've been with them a long time. Was, was there, has that always been their approach or before did they used to go in like a, you know, bull in a China shop? Is there a transformation? Has it happened? Is it because of you? Um, I definitely think there's a transformation. If it's uh, because of me, um, I don't know. But actually, I have to say that this new approach, what you were just referring to, that coming also in as a guest, want to learn from this new culture, because there is a company who does amazing things, things already, but is looking for a partner now to scale and get the right support. So it's not about to telling them, hey, now we do it the opposite way. Now we do it the, the corporate way. That's, that's not the case. It's really about also learning from them. And this is so important. And as a leader, when you come in there, um, this also was the benefit I, I had that I wanted to learn because for me, it was not only a new country. It is a new industry. I yeah. was not 100% familiar with the SaaS business, with the IoT platform business, with ecosystem and partnerships. And you related to that at the beginning as well, how important these ecosystems become more and more. Yes. So I, I was here to learn and I wanted to hear from the employees, hey, what is this industry about? How can we scale? Because it's also not that they are not good ideas. This may be the environment they have been in before, they were not able to get to the growth trajectory we are on now. And um, that's, I think is, is definitely really, really helpful. And again, coming back to that, I'm not sure if I'm the reason that Siemens does it now, but I'm a big, big supporter of that. We do acquisitions in a different way. And um, what I also say is you have to think of, I, I came then from Siemens and I also told then uh, my colleagues, my peers before I started here, let's think of it that how can we help the target or the, the company we are acquiring to be successful and not think about what do they have to do to make us more successful. So the other way around. And I yes. think that, that's the way how you can make uh, acquisitions in a big corporate environment more successful besides not some other organizational pieces. It's mainly up here in the head. It's a mindset topic. But it's a complete 180. Yep. Right? Because yep. it's like, you know, we're going to acquire these this company and we'll be more successful. We'll have that market share or whatever it might be but you're approaching it from a place of how can we make them more successful, which will make us more successful. Exactly. But then you're not minimizing or downplaying what they've done well. And I think that this is really important for everybody listening because, and I'll tell you why, just in a, because it's a greater context. And the greater context is this, you have a sales department you have a, a marketing department, you have an accounting department, you have all these different departments, you know, um, and you look at them and you go, well, they're successful. How can they make us more successful rather than how can we make that department, that team more successful rather than they're not making us successful? And I think it's a really interesting uh, way to look at it, Stefan, in, in shifting the mindset uh, within, a, uh, and again, thinking of a, a, of a small team as uh, an independent organization that you're trying to take care of rather than tear apart and make them conform. It's very interesting. I 100% I agree. And um, 
What I always also have on, on my mind and actually um, pieces I have always written in my office that it reminds me. So what, what, one thing is, if you want to make a change, have a look at your face, have a look at your face and make the change. And the yeah. other one is from a technology point of view that I believe this decade we are in now is proving to have so much change in our industry and transformation that only the ones who are able to change and come up with new business model, be disruptive, will survive. And I always talk to Siemens about that in, an, in a way you just described it because they did, the big corporates, they did an amazing job over so many decades. It's not that we want to dilute what they have achieved. No. It's more about how can we together protect the future from the past and not the other way around. Well, I mean, you're bringing up something there that, again, is a very important piece for us to go to. Um, and it was part of what I said at the beginning, which is, you know, I, 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 you and I talked about this last time we spoke. And I said that I believe, it's just my belief, I believe that um, this COVID period we're in will be, when we look back, the fastest innovative time because we don't tend to innovate. We, we upgrade a bit, but we don't tend to innovate when things are good. We don't do that in, in a bull market. We do that in a bear market. We do that when things are tough. We do it when, when there's necessity for it, that we, we get innovative, we make changes and we're nimble about it. And we're also, we do it on a lower budget because there's, there's not as much, ref uh, as much funds available or resources available. And as a result, as we talked about, a lot of big organizations have and will continue to come crashing down during this period of time. And only the ones who decided, you know, oh, you know, this is an ocean liner and we've got to turn it on a dime really fast. And you've adopted that in the context of this because it is about being nimble. But how do you become nimble while having an ocean liner? And that's really what you've done. And that came to, um, to fruition through what you touched on regarding the award about being nimble that in six weeks, tell us about what, what six weeks, what the offering was that, what did you say? I think you said six years it would have taken for Siemens to do it. I, I never would say that. Um, well, maybe you I didn't say that, right. but a big company would take about six years to do that that level of a release of something. Exactly. So um, in the end, it was an offering we put together for our clients to help them to be able, in case you have to operate in an office environment or a manufacturing environment, to do automated contact tracing. And um, the beauty of a platform, you said it at the beginning, IoT platform business is actually that you can adapt fast to changing environments. And uh, then how we run it in the end, this idea came up from one of our engineers. So why shouldn't we do that? So we have a platform, we claim flexibility. So now let's help our customers to really uh, and demonstrate that flexibility. So the team came together, we have a different approval process that we say, okay, it makes right. sense. You don't have enough time to evaluate the market, how much is in there in, in this market. It was really about, we want to make an impact. We want to help our customers. It is a great idea. Let's do it. And then we went on. And even what, what makes me even more proud, we had an ecosystem partner on board. It was not only our own solution. With an ecosystem partner together, we developed that solution, came out to the market in a little bit over than six weeks. And wow, this is, we, we received actually for that, the company itself, not only my award, there have been two more awards we received on that because this shows the, the power of innovation. This shows the power of when team works, when teams work together. Um, and I even believe if we would be together, if, or if we would come together in a room, so not doing everything remotely as we have to do these days, um, this might have been possible in a little bit under five or four weeks as well to put something together like that. And that's amazing and makes me so exciting about the future because there's more to come. And you said it before because of the adaption rate now in the industry and this transformation just got accelerated through this pandemic. So we will see much more of this and this, and you're in the middle of it, which makes it so, so exciting also. But, but I think that, you know, like you just said that this is why I believe 
many big companies are going to fall in the next year because they really are they're sit, sitting around going, well, when things get back to normal, they're not going back. And, and when you get a, a massive organization like Siemens who are approaching, you know, your, your, your acquisition companies and saying, there's where the innovation is, there's where the nimble is and let them teach us how to move things faster. That is so revolutionary because so often it is, I mean, think about, um, I think about Amazon, which is gigantic, but I think about what they did with Zappos. When they bought Zappos, they went, they said to Tony J, keep going. You're doing it right. Keep going. And it's that understanding of you understand that small market rather than this overlord egoic um dominant leadership style and i think it's going to crush so many of these big companies because they don't understand the leadership needs to be nimble the the innovation needs to be nimble and you guys seem to have done that so well and you used it in in the context of covid is that correct um exactly so um, in that instance, we used it in the context of COVID. I quickly want to touch on something you said before as yeah. well. That a lot of big companies will crush as well. You're right. But what I also see at the moment in the market, when you talk to industry leaders of big corporations, the appetite to do it differently is so big at yeah. the moment. And yeah, Good. the interest in really looking into how can we do it differently in the future. Um, I've never seen it um, to the extent I, I see it in, in, uh, at this point in time, so which makes me also hopeful yes. that we see more innovation because it's also about innovation when you leave these companies nimble, alone, and yep. let them act like that. And secondly, I also believe we, this helps also more for adaption in the industry of technology because this was also one of the pieces what I was a little bit missing before. The market was there. The adaption rate was very slow because of humans. There's this nice graph where you can see how this technology innovation goes up and the, the human adaption uh, is very slow. So this gap between mm -hmm. innovation and human adaption is getting bigger and bigger. Due to COVID, we close a little bit the gap and this will really help not only our industry in general um, to, yeah, in, in the end for me, it's also helping a little bit society and humanity with that with that solutions we are we are providing and, and other companies are providing uh, to make it to make it a better world. Yeah, it, it's it's an interesting time because I've been saying to the lead the, the lead the leadership teams that I work with is that the time for innovation and technology we've all been talking about that for twenty years, but now it really is at, at its like you know it's yeah. really in demand, yeah. but. If you get caught in that, you're going to go down the toilet because it's also just as quickly moving to the understanding that your soft skills are not soft skills. They are essential skills because if you put technology forward without humanity, you'll get what you said, that gap. But if you bring the humanity into the innovation and the technology, that's when people will adopt very fast. And they can only do that if they are recognized as being human. If you understand how to communicate and how to connect with them and how to listen as you, you know, as you, as your uh, Opa taught you, if you, if you listen, if you learn how to listen, they will tell you how, how, how they want to adopt what it is that you're trying to bring into the marketplace. So it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating time. And I really do believe we will look back at this time and say, that was the moment that was the moment it all changed and people are you know right now they're just caught in the whole idea of you know oh the, you know all the normals going away but i think it's going to be a, a fascinating time i i fully agree and um i mean what you also need these days where we spoke a little bit about how can we stay sane during that time and everything an open mindset definitely helps you and really approaching this change. I know it's not comfortable for everyone, but really no. be open for it um, and try to embrace it as much as possible and try to be the driver, try to make the change and not that you have an external force and changing you. And for me, that's not only valid for business. This is also valid uh, for, for private circumstances, uh, so to speak. 
because anyway, these days in the last 12 months, I'm, I spend more time at home than ever. And uh, yeah. I'm not sure if my kids will ever understand in their age what it means when I will go back to an office environment. And I'm not <laughs> here from Monday to Friday, uh, for example. But yeah. let's see. It'll be interesting, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so l- let's talk about, you know, in that human side of it, we want to talk about the culture because one can only imagine and lighted the, the company culture would have been, I, I, one would imagine, I'm not saying it's true because I don't know, you do, that it would be very different than Siemens. So how are you managing to keep the culture alive and hopefully thriving while everyone is still aware that there is a controlling entity being Siemens? So um, very, very good question. So what, what the, the leadership team and mainly um, the CFO and myself, what we try to do, we try to protect the enlightened culture environment from the big Siemens one. This means we take a lot of what's coming there our way, which is, I mean, from a Siemens point of view I, or from the big corporate, I, I fully understand there are requests there. But of we course. try to keep this away because this would just slow us down, will put up more silos, will take away innovation from us. So we can deal with that. That's one thing. And secondly, I mean, we still continue doing what startups do. So we try to align with, we are here in the Bay Area. So we um, embedded in a lot of startups. We try also to figure out, so what are they doing? Um, how do they engage with their employees? And it is different from a big corporation. So that's how we try to manage it uh, today. And I, I proudly say the feedback we are receiving so far, we have been quite successful. And I know how hard it is for us because we deal on both sides. So we are in the sandwich position or in the yeah. position where people uh, pull and from the top, they push on us. So um, yeah, I'm I'm really grateful. And I also have to say, I have a lot of supporters also in Siemens because it's we want to change. And we spoke about that earlier, um, that there's a need for change, how mm. open are companies to change. And this is what you also need, kind of kind of people who support you on the other side, on the big corporation, that the things you are doing are the right things. Because one thing I also, what always comes back and I hear about is jealousy. Because as we do things differently, and a lot of people think we shouldn't do things differently, this is also some jealousy because we are able to do, to do other things, which maybe in a big corporation environment you're not able to do. And... Also managing that, that is another aspect to all this startup in a big corporate, staying nimble, staying focused, um, and so on. So I, yeah, I like- There's a lot that. in there. And, and so really, I'm, I, I would love for you, if you can, for you to sort of um, share with us a, a sort of sense of how do you create this? Cause you know, it's part of what I said at the beginning, how do you create this, this open ecosystem of collaboration because of that jealousy? Cause the, in the small acquisition company, I'm not going to share with them. You know, they're the big brother and, and, and the big brother's looking down and oh, who cares about them. And so there's, I mean, it's, it's part of human nature that desire to want to, hoard and keep something close rather than sharing it how can you walk us through a little bit for those people who are maybe in a similar position to you who are now uh, leading an, ac- an acquired company and going i can't get these buggers to fall in line um or on the other side going yeah they're keeping us out they're keeping us walled out and you know so how have you managed to tear down the walls and can you walk us through some steps in how you keep that ecosystem of collaboration um yeah a very good question and i think it's uh, several folded actually so one piece is um that um you have to show them that what we are doing is helping also their success so this is one thing where you get buy-in that um not with innovation but also with how we address customers how we address actually current use cases or pain points on the customer side has actually a bigger impact on, on all of us. And it's not only for the startup, so there's no need to be jealous because in the end, it will, will help all of us to be successful. Secondly, I, I, I truly believe, and I've seen it, that this um, pandemic has helped in that instance because everything what we are saying 
pre-COVID. Um, it sometimes yeah it comes across and hey, you really think that's going to happen? This is crazy. Where do you see that in the market? And I think in our environment, it's not so easy to see the change, like in maybe in the consumer market where it's far more obvious. In our market, in the build environment, it's not on the surface. It's actually somewhere in the back, it is happening, this change. And um, during the pandemic, for established players, it became more and more obvious what is happening there. And you can ex mm. exactly see the trends in the market. Again, this helped them because we were advocating that before that our word be, uh, become, became more weight or got more weight in the end because it it proven it is proven now that it's exactly the way it's trending what we said before um, and then I personally I'm I'm a communicator I'm an I'm an extrovert I'm a communicator so I use my my network in Siemens to talk a lot um, to yeah, try to figure out so what's the pain points there? Why do you think that way? How can we make that? So I'm yeah, kind of negotiating um, a little bit back and forth, which again then helps our team to stay again focused because I, I do that. And on the other side, also to get the support, because besides being nimble, separate, independent, no doubt we need the support from Siemens in many, many ways. It's not that you can just uh, deny that. And um, that's three three uh, main themes what I was pursuing um, since since I'm here. And again, I'm pretty happy with the outcome so far because I know how difficult what we just talk, talked about uh, this is uh, for both sides. So it's not only that I claim this no, is no. hard for us. It's well, also this is why I'm yeah. saying I think it's interesting because you're kind of the middleman who has to, I mean, being in the middle of anything is horrible. I don't yeah. care what anybody says. It's horrible because, you know, you, you've got to fight for both sides. So you got to fight for, for, you know, well, Siemens owns us and they have a set of uh, outcomes and agendas and they have, the, they have the purse strings. And on the other side, you're fighting for this smaller company who is a startup, who is doing innovative things and who have certain needs and that is a, that's why i'm saying about this balancing act for anybody who's in your position because inevitably they i mean i know because i've dealt with these leaders as my private clients who say i i'm i think i'm actually gonna leave the larger company and go work for somebody smaller because i feel so pulled and it's so difficult, or I'm going to get away from the, from running this smaller organization because I don't like ha being in the middle. How have you managed to stay sane in the middle? Because it is a difficult position and it's like negotiating between teams. Again, you know, if you think about it in a different level, rather than companies, it seems, and you're negotiating between sales and marketing, which seem to be tied but often have diametrically opposed outcomes yeah um if i really manage to stay sane you have to ask others so i hope <laughs> that's, I that's a minor question <laughs> <laughs> so um good one so um it comes back a little bit what we spoke at the beginning about family support so right. i we don't talk about business in general at home but i can phrase challenges i'm facing with my wife in a way that she can provide me answers or asks me the right questions so that I get coaching from her. Mm -hmm. I also had the privilege to doing an MBA and I was a big fan of it, an executive MBA with a lot of experience in class, um, stayed connected with people, bouncing off ideas, uh, getting some coaching there as well. Um, and then last but not least, I would say, I still find time also outside the office where I really can Think of something else where really uh distract your mind exactly mm -hmm. and um these are these are three things which which really um help me and then on, on the other side i'm very passionate about it i hope you can you can hear that i'm passionate about the things we're doing i'm totally convinced um that this is the right thing to do mm -hmm. and this really helps me then also to to stay focused and not getting somewhere okay is this now crazy really is it crazy is it i'm i'm, I'm losing now or i'm away from reality and things like that this is really also um uh, what helps me to stay 
stay sane during during these these uh, times. So, um, and again, my, I think uh, that I communicate a lot also with others. And I said again, I ask questions, but I'm also happy if I have someone who asks me a lot of questions. Mm. It helps me then to reflect, think about things, and uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, to externally process what it is that's going on in the mind. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Let, let's talk a little bit about um, about what it is that the company does, because it's kind of fascinating, I think, for for our listeners. Um, and Lighted built a, a sense that it goes in light fittings, I think you told me, um, and it senses movement in the building. Um, and that's pretty cool, um, particularly in these times of uh, pandemic and, you know, social distancing and all the rest of it. But I also want to talk about the other side of it, which is Big Brother's watching me. <laughs> it feels a bit Big Brother-ish, right? You know, talking, you know, me, you know uh, I'm trying to remember who wrote it, but it said, you know, that, you know, we worry about the CIA uh, listening to our calls and getting all our private information, but we voluntarily give it to everybody with social media. And now with, you know, like London, um, I think it was three years ago was the most filmed population in the world, cameras on every corner. And we were all like, Oh my God, it's a police state. And now people are like, eh, whatever, you know, and now you've got the, the app in, in China which is the social uh, app, which checks whether you cross the road by a jaywalk or whether you're speaking badly about your neighbors and you don't get access to travel if you've been a bad person. I mean, feels a bit police statey. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy that you asked me that question. And let me Good. start with, with, a, with an anecdote, actually. Good. I went once actually in Europe with one of our account managers to a client meeting. And he started the client meeting with saying, ah, I see you guys, everybody is on WhatsApp, which kind of the um, iMessenger for um, combining Android and so on. Yeah. Everybody is on, on WhatsApp. So it doesn't seem like we have any issue here with data privacy. I mean, interesting opening for me in general. Yeah. This is how he opened the meeting, but a uh, little bit uh, more serious there. Data privacy is one of our key pillars of the organization. And we, because we know in the business we are in and what, uh, what data and insights we provide is, is very important for us that first of all, the data is secure and it's 100% anonymized. Anonymized, yeah. So you don't know. I, did, I couldn't say that word and, you, and it's not even your first language. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> I thought yeah, it goes so, so fluently. It might be wrong because it was too fluent. Um, Better than me. <laughs> So um, very important for us. So we don't we don't track or locate individuals. We track or locate numbers, which can be an asset, which can be an employee, a guest, and so on. But you never can link a number to the individual person who it is. So that's very important. And mm -hmm. then on the other side, also we provide and make it very clear to the client. We provide that insights and data to our customer. And then the customer also has the responsibility. So it's a, for me, it's two ways as well mm -hmm. to honor this data privacy, what we do and not that they take it then and personalize it. Actually, right. it's not our responsibility because then it's on the customer side, but nevertheless, we feel responsible because it's our system who provides the insights that it's 100% um, um, in line with data privacy, GDPR and all the rules around the world or all the regulations around the world which are in place. But this topic, I mean, I agree with you, this comes up all the time, which is sure. a, a serious topic and it needs to be addressed. On the other side, what I see also, and I, I'm not no, uh, no different to a lot of leaders, a lot of customers, sure. I would say, I believe that we make more trade-offs when it comes to data privacy in our private lives compared to business, which is fair because in the business, we have a bigger responsibility. On mm -hmm. the other side, I also reflect on myself, would I, how do I treat or deal with it privately? Mm -hmm. and, uh, this is also when we have customer discussions, we discuss that always as well. So it's not like this uh, floppy opening where you say WhatsApp, okay, you are fine with data privacy or not. Um, mm -hmm. It's really a serious discussion where you have to ask yourself, 
um, how you how you feel about this in your private life compared to your business life. Professional yeah, life. it's it. I mean, right here, you and I could probably go for another hour just on the the morality and and the ethics yep. of data privacy and who owns the data and who doesn't own the data because as a member of the public most of our data is not owned by ourselves it's owned by facebook it's owned by twitter or whoever it is and you know as somebody said i'm trying to remember it was who said that um if you think it's free you're paying for it yeah. right because you are the product yeah. Right. So it's, you know, it's free for me to use Facebook because I'm the product. Right. So, or whatever it might be. I remember that. I think it was, was it social dilemma? I also recently, yes. Uh, yeah. That was um, exactly. If it's, it's not for free, you pay for it in some way. Yeah. And you're paying for it because you are the product yeah, that exactly. they're selling your data every yeah. single day. And, and it, and that's why I'm saying, I wanted to bring this up because you know, um, I, I've had these conversations with many people and, I, and I, I remember recently, my wife and I, we just became grandparents again. And we were talking about a particular product for our, for our new grandbaby. And as we were talking about that product, a day later, I'm on Facebook and there's the product. And I'm like, we didn't talk about it on the phone, did we? And she goes, no, we don't have Alexa no or anything similar so where is that information coming from because it wasn't mind reading it i know that so somewhere we are being our conversation is being tracked and using advertising to show me that product now is that convenient sure what if i'm talking about stuff i don't want to have advertising at before so it's, it's very fascinating it's it's fascinating and scary I'm, I mean it in a totally that way. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and you said something important, and this is also um, how, how we how we see it. It is not our data; it's our clients' data. We just provide exactly. a service for them to give to give meaningful insights, which drive then action afterwards. So this is how we see it as well. Um, and um, I think sometimes, yeah, as you mentioned as well, we forget that who owns the data. So it's never our enlightened data, because again, it's owned by individuals, by our customer and so on. We just try to provide meaningful insights, which drive then action. Do you, you know, from, because you're really in that world in a way that most people are not, do you, do you see, do you believe there will be changes in that around, you know, because obviously you're operating at a very ethical level if you don't own the data. Do you see, do you think that that will change? Do you think that um, that there'll be mandates by governments around that kind of thing? Are you seeing anything of that inside of your industry? Um, we see trends to that uh, because again, through this pandemic, we also started to pop starting as a society or as a economy to populate more data than ever before because of right. what's going on. Um, I truly believe so. I, I see a lot of efforts from NGOs um, and so on um, that there needs to be more regulation around that. Um, and um, yeah, so I would say I, I see it. This is my personal opinion. I'm not um, yeah, I understand. representing here um, no. any, any, any company, but my personal opinion is what I've seen so far is that we will see a change in the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, to that because more data populated this topic is getting more and more important at the moment maybe a little bit in the background because there are as i said before sometimes we make trade-offs now you have sure. these discussions around corona tracing apps or corona contact um, apps in different uh, countries where also data privacy is always uh, a top priority to discuss how you make sure um, that uh, your privacy is secured there. And um, yeah, so, but I, I truly believe we see, yeah. we see change there. What I wanted to say as well, what helped me actually as a different perspective, because I worked, as you said, in Germany, yes. different approach. Then Singapore, complete different approach. Yeah. Then Australia, different approach. Now in the US, again, different approach. So this really also helps to get some perspective because I don't see just one way of thinking you get more opinions how you can deal with that and this helps you then also for the company in general to make 
what we believe at that point in time, the right decision, how you deal with it, because you have more, more input. More and that's, that is what I wanted to ask you, because when I, you know, again, this is my observation, not fully integration, but observation. Um, little bit of time in Germany, very little. But, you know, I understand that the, the educational system that we operate of in the United States and around the world is the Prussian schooling system, which is originally German and was originally designed for the industrial age. It's outdated, but it gets people to conform. Yep. Then you go to Singapore. Singapore is a very hard rules place. Makes Germany look like kind of slack, right? Um, <laughs> I know people who live in Singapore and, you know, you're going to get a caning because you spit on the street. And it's going to be public and welcome to 1865 with, with modern technology, right? So very rules bearing Australia, where I came from, um, more of an open free society, more of a wild West society, but the rules around uh, the country are very rigid because it's an Island nation. No, no other country sprays you down before you get off the plane um, and the stuff they will take away from you that you would normally be able to take into a country is insane. I mean, it's a very, so a lot of these places are rules-based countries. America is kind of lax in a lot of those, you know, by comparison, you know, it's like, it's a bit wild westy and it's also from one state to the next state is different. So Talk to us about how you've how that's been for you, you know, as as you've adapted through that, and then coming into this this nebulous technology world that is um, global and not at the same time. Um, yeah, so I mean, you you described it perfectly. Also, what we what we uh, saw traveling around the world, living in different countries on different continents, how how this approaches with the rules and so on. So in the end, um, you get into cultural training normally from the company when they send you somewhere. I right. have to say this doesn't help. What helps no. you is engaging with locals. They put things into perspective, yeah. ask them questions. And what actually something which just came to my mind, which I believe um, driven mainly by my wife and uh, because I spend a lot of time uh, with the business and so on. We are very social people as well. Connecting to the locals and my wife is 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 fundamental, incremental for that. And uh, she's connecting to our neighbors, to others when our son goes to school here. Um, this really helps also to put things into perspective, how to approach things, because you said it as well, spitting in Singapore on the street will maybe they kick you out of the country or someone has to uh, release you from jail or whatever. Um, in the end, when you talk to the locals, yeah, this is a rule like that. Does it mean that everybody who by accident spits on the street gets um, behind bars? No, um, that's not the case. So this is one thing um, what, what really helped me. And then again, I come back to this topic guest. I always want to comply with the rules because I'm a guest here mm -hmm. in the other countries as well. I want to behave like a guest, like someone comes to my house, I have an expectation. So I'm here to follow the rules, even if the culture, and you you um, uh, alluded to that a little bit as well, that in America, we see the approach a little bit different to rules and regulations compared to Singapore, compared to Germany. And, um, but nevertheless, we as, as foreigners, we always um, are here to comply with everything because we want to stay here. We like it here. And sure. we actually found a lot of friends and um, yeah, so that's, that's how, how, how we approached it. And um, I think that made us as a family kind of successful because behind every successful leader, and you know that better than me because you talk to so many, is also a supporting environment with the family. And this is then part of it when you move yes. around, that you make them happy, you make them successful, um, and so on. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a great believer in you have two families. You have the one you're born into and the one you create. And the one you create is not always blood. So, you know, you may have your children and your partner or whatever it is, but you also have these people that you surround yourself with who become your cultural educators. And like you, having lived in lots of different countries, I've, you know, I've, I, you know, I, I've learned so much 
just by being in those environments. And, you know, you talked about integration. One of the things for me, uh, my wife and I do this, even when we go on holiday, which is we will leave wherever we are and, we, and we'll find some local people and we'll say, where do you eat? And we'll go eat there. Yeah. And, and uh, where's the market? Yeah. And we go to the market and we buy little bits and bobs and, and wander around the market. And, and oftentimes people can't speak the same language and that's okay. That's on us, not on them. But we, you know, you start to watch people and you learn just by being in the environment with these people. Exactly. Because I can remember when I first left the UK as a kid, uh, as a young man, like 20, 21 years old and traveling and thinking, Oh, these people are pigs because they ate with their hands yeah. <laughs> because it's very British. You know, must have a knife and fork. We'll have tea with the queen. Make sure you can get out. You know, and then you realize, no, this is actually, there's nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Uh, and then realizing I've got my feet up uh, in Asia and people are very upset. And I'm like, well, get over it. No, no, I have to get over it. I'm insulting the person by pointing my feet at them. Yep. So th these cultural differences, we, we, I think a lot of us tend, particularly as Westerners, approach the world as if we know better rather than as the guest. And I, and I love that you brought that to being a leader. So not just being a guest in a country, but being a guest in a, in a company yep. and saying, okay, I'm the guest. What's the culture here? Is the culture we eat with forks? Is the culture we eat with chopsticks? Is the culture we eat with hands? You know, yep. not literally eating, but how are we being with each other that creates the community? Because in the integration in an M&A, a lot of what it comes down to is what is this culture? Because we talk about culture, company culture, but we also talk about country's culture. So why yep. wouldn't you approach it that way as the guest in understanding that culture? And saying, okay, well, how do you guys do it? Yeah. Rather than, well, this is how you have to do it now. So I really appreciate you bringing that forward. I mean, I couldn't agree more. And what just then popped into my mind is thinking of how many leaders, unfortunately, I have to, I, I saw failing because not of the business piece, of the cultural aspect. And again, it brings yes. also to the perspective what you said before. It's not only about the country you come in. When you think about the businesses, it's about the corporate, the startup, and how you manage this. And um, we, and me personally, when I brought in leaders from overseas, I underestimated that component a lot, especially the first one with the culture. Underestimated mm -hmm. it a lot. And um, yeah, this is um, something which I also, I always tell the, my, my mentees when I talk to them, if you have the chance to go overseas and work there, do it, but you have to want it and you need support when you have a family that everybody wants it. Otherwise you're set up for failure and nobody will be happy. No, that's great yeah. input. Really is. Um, I have loved our conversation, my friend. Thank you so much for everything you've shared. And I think it's really important for in a more and more globalized world, where we are interacting with other cultures, even if your people are remote and you're dealing with people who are in India or Pakistan or some other country that you don't think of, or Indonesia or whatever it might be, yeah. that you're dealing with a culture and you're dealing with a culture inside of a culture. So there's a culture called the American culture. There's a, there's a uh, culture called uh, uh, Enlightened. There's a culture called Siemens. You know, there's three cultures all trying to interact. And, that, and you could think of those as three different countries and it's all three different local cultures. And it's a really, I love the way you're bringing that forward. Um, I'm going to ask you uh, two last things before we finish up. One, of course, is how people can find out more about you and all the work you do and all the resources, et cetera. But I also want to always, always ask, what is one thing, if you could give one piece of practical advice that would allow our listeners to really grasp what it is you're saying and put it in action, preferably in the next 24 to 48 hours, what would that piece of practical advice be? Actually, I said it before, and this is, if you want to make a change, have a look at your face and make the change, because I truly believe how much we complain, we still can define our own destiny, and it's up to us to make 
it's successful or wherever we want to go. It's none of anyone else's business. It's our own decision. It all starts with the men in the mirror, as Michael Jackson said. Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, I agree fully. I Stefan, mean, again, as I said, I've, I've really enjoyed our conversation. Please tell our listeners, our viewers, where they can find out more about you, about the company, about how people can reach out to you and be connected to you in any way, shape, or form. Um, yeah, thanks. So um, you can reach me on uh, stefan.schwab at enlightening.com. Um, also still with the Siemens ending, so stefan.schwab at siemens.com. That's the beauty of this, uh, <laughs> to uh, the corporate and the startup world. Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn as well, so happy to connect. Um, looking forward if people want to want to reach out to me. I have not written a book. I learned a lot from your guests. They have written a book. Um, I'm reading these days a lot of books. So um, there you cannot uh, you, you cannot reach out to me or getting insights in a book. So I'm happy that you connect me, uh, you or that you connect with me um, via via social media. And wonderful. I always like stay curious. Yes. Thank you. And of course, we will we will make sure that we post all the links in the show notes so that you can reach out to Stefan. And it has been a pleasure and an honor. Thank you, sir. And for you, dear listener, if you would like to hang out with other conscious leaders and chat about this episode or any of our past episodes, you can go into our Facebook or LinkedIn groups. Just look for the Leadership and Loyalty podcast. It doesn't matter how successful you are. If your employees and your customers don't understand what gives your company meaning, it, you're only working at a fraction of your true capability. To find out more about how you can hire me, Dov Barron, as a speaker or leadership advisor for, and strategist for yourself or your organization, simply go to dovbaron.com. That's D-O-V-B-A-R-O-N.com. Because unified meaning is the one single monolithic difference between mediocrity and greatness for individuals and companies. We want to thank you for sharing the show with everyone you know. Till next time, stay curious, my friends, stay curious about how you can create a nimble collaborative environment by understanding that you're a guest in the culture of the company you just acquired. I'm Dolph Barron. I'm here to assist you tapping into your Dragonfire to reach that next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. And I am out. Thank you.